I now look to Chris Garner, St Peter's College, to open the case for the opposition. Thank you very much, Mr President. I'm afraid this is going to be a rather short debate, because I intend to win it with just two words. Donald and Trump. I can understand why you might want to vote with the proposition tonight. It might make you feel better to say that individual apathy is the greatest threat to our climate, because you feel like you can do something about it. Or maybe it just appeals to that intuitive sense that, with a problem this big, people should care. But unfortunately, I'm not here to make you feel better this evening. The proposition's argument is grounded on the very same logic that says that the addict is more responsible than the dealer. And we, ladies and gentlemen, are a world addicted to fossil fuels. The reality is that we no longer live in a society where real power lies in the hands of the people. So the solution to this problem must be top-down, not bottom-up. To avoid the catastrophic consequences of climate change, we need to reduce <coughs> net emissions to zero within a generation. And the power to do this lies not in individuals' hands, but with those institutions that govern global society today. But what is this debate really about? When we talk about the greatest threat to our climate, we're really talking about what is the greatest barrier to solving this problem? Tonight, Rob tried to tell us that this is apathy, that um, individuals are the real cause. But surveys show that worldwide, in every country developing and developed, 40% of adults have never heard of climate change. So it's, I struggle to um, understand why it's really apathy. And even if we could persuade those 40%, and even the 60% that have heard about it, to do something, to act, millions of people acting in concert are not enough to solve this problem. The pro it's just too big a scale. And thirdly, apathy itself is not the problem. If you think about it like this, domestic law constrains our decisions all the time in every sphere of life. And there's no reason why we couldn't just be constrained in such a way that made us eco-friendly. The way um, if they only took our bins when we did, um, when we separated our rubbish, or the government only allowed the selling of energy efficient appliances. It wouldn't matter if we were apathetic. We would still be in a world that didn't have climate change. But tonight I will suggest that Trump is emblematic of the two greatest threats to our climate, the failings of international law and oil companies. But before I enlighten you further, it falls on me to introduce the proposition this evening. We've just heard from Rob, um, a second year earth sciences student from St Anne's and chair of the consultative committee. So Rob actually got first dibs on which side of the debate to speak on this evening. Um, I, was, I, was, I was assigned. It really shouldn't surprise us that he chose to speak on that side of the debate. As an earth sciences student, he's almost certainly got an internship with BP lined up next summer anyway. <laughs> Second up, we've got Barry Gardner, the Shadow Secretary of State for International Trade and Shadow Minister for International Climate Change. You've actually been um, a Labour MP for longer than I've been alive. Um, but it's still... <laughs> still felt the need to give me a little uh, dig in the ribs on the way in to disable your position. Um, thirdly, we've got Angela Smith, um, also Labour MP, Shadow Deputy Leader of the House of Commons from 2011 to 2014. And I ask that um, if I'm ever speaking from a dispatch box against this many Labour MPs again, that someone puts me out of my misery, because this paid up Labour Party member will have seriously lost his way. <laughs> Finally, we have Sir David King, the current Special Advisor to the Foreign Secretary for Climate Change and Emeritus Professor of Physical Chemistry at Cambridge. I genuinely look forward to hearing how your um, expertise on energy alternatives has led you to argue in favour of the motion tonight. Mr President, these are your speakers and they are most welcome. So what is the greatest threat to our climate? Since things need to change unilaterally and on an interstate level, I'm going to start with international law. Now, some people think that we live in a world, it's sort of, it's Hobbesian, so states are playing a zero-sum game. 
They're constantly pitting their interests against each other. And like in the prisoner's dilemma, this results in a suboptimal outcome where uh, <coughs> both countries, but all countries are worse off, which in our context means a, wo a world with climate change. However, liberalists suggest that when countries come together to create collective institutions, order can overcome that chaos. And the, the elegantly named United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change is an example of this. Um, it provides an essential forum for dialogue and decision making on climate <coughs> issues. And recently it has made modest achievements with the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement, I'm sure you've all heard of. However, convincing a critical mass of countries to legally bind themselves to um, voluntary obligations for the collective good is a challenge that this current framework has failed to rise to. The problem of climate change is essentially an, an externality problem. It creates a problem of the commons where it is in each country's interest to pollute um, because they get the benefits of prosperity while the cost of pollution are shared among all the countries. And what international legal agreements are trying to achieve is what game theorists call a situation of stable, partial cooperation. However, currently, international law lacks the mechanisms, the strong enough mechanisms to enforce compliance to an adequate level. And this allows countries like the US and China to hold the entire system of climate negotiations to ransom. It pains me to return to Trump, but he is the perfect example. The fact that he can pull America out of the Paris Agreement with total impunity uh, epitomizes what is wrong with the legal system. On top of this, other legal institutions, such as the World Trade Organization, act as if climate change isn't, isn't real. Um, a low carbon import policy would almost certainly violate many of their clauses. And the estimated 382 billion of annual subsidies for fossil fuels are never challenged, while the relatively trivial subsidies for renewable energies um, are constantly stopped. For this reason, it seems clear to me that international law is one of the greatest threats to our climate. And the other is not apathy, it is corporations. The threat that corporations pose is threefold. They directly emit, they block action by governments, and they spread disinformation. I said at the start I would convince you with Donald Trump. And if I haven't done that yet, then I want you to listen to this statistic. Just 100 companies are responsible for 71% of human emissions. I'm going to say that again. Just 100 companies are responsible for 71% of humanity's emissions ever. This means that if we're talking about the big picture thinkers, the, the CEOs, the chairpersons, they could fit in this debating chamber. Some of the worst offenders, as you can imagine, are ExxonMobil, uh, Shell, BP. Um, <laughs> But you have to consider the relative responsibility of these, these few companies versus the seven billion people just going around their daily lives within the economic systems that they find themselves. These companies will continue to drill and explore to enjoy their assets and hedge against future losses and behave as if climate change is basically just a financial risk rather than an actual existential threat to humanity. I don't mean to be melodramatic, but after nuclear war, climate change poses the greatest threat to this planet. And they are not apathetic. They know exactly what they're doing. And not only do they emit on a quite unimaginable scale, they also block climate action and ensure that we get our energy from the most profitable rather than the most sustainable sources. As some of the largest corporations in the world, each with the GDP of a small country, they have immense lobbying power. Even if we could overcome the problems with international law that I spoke about earlier, we would still and come to, um, cut some sort of Paris on steroids agreement, because that would be greater than anything we've done so far. It will mean very little if it's undermined by fossil fuel companies in, when it comes to enforcement. This small set of fossil fuel companies holds the key to systemic cha uh, change in our carbon emissions. And the third threat that these companies pose is disinformation. ExxonMobil knew about climate change and the threat it posed in 1981. That's seven years before it even became a public issue. And Greenpeace estimates that since then they've spent over $30 million funding research and think tanks that um, support climate denial. 
while now BP and Shell and companies like that are starting to acknowledge the fact that we need to move towards a, a greener future, um, almost all of them have failed to make an actual clean break with the uh, industry associations and trade groups that block action and spread this disinformation. Climate scientists are up against the best financed marketing operation in human, human history. They actively cultivate the apathy that the proposition suggests is the problem. You were right, apathy is a problem. And you said that you know, it's the fault of voters that we have these leaders like Trump. But you haven't gone far enough back along the chain of causation when these companies are the ones responsible for sowing the seeds of doubt in people's minds. History will place the blame for this devastation squarely at the feet of the fossil fuel companies. And the devastation is all the more catastrophic when they are backed by a president that goes around saying that anthropogenic climate change is a hoax and appointing the ex-CEO of ExxonMobil, Rex Tillerson, as his Secretary of State. What we are witnessing, ladies and gentlemen, is a deadly alliance between the world's most powerful corporations and most powerful world leaders. Someone please tell me how this is not the greatest threat to our climate. And to conclude, we need to be realistic. Dealing with the greatest threat to our climate requires us not to sit around and hope that people wake up to the urgency of this situation. It, re it requires a top-down approach. We need to regulate the companies and corporations, and we need to work with the international community through stronger legal mechanisms. Trump will continue to undermine these efforts, and this is why he's been such a, a key part of my speech tonight. This is a man who rejects scientific consensus. He rejects international cooperation, but he supports the interests of global corporations that are destroying the planet. So, with his sagging orange face and his smug, fixed grin in your mind's eye, I implore you, ladies and gentlemen, vote with the opposition tonight. Thank you very much.